Uh, I always want to be making something, and this just gave me the full, like, permission to do anything I wanted. So there, there would be days I would wake up with an idea, and by noon have published that. Hi, I'm Gary Snow, and welcome to the Daiku Podcast. Today with me is Philip Reed, who is, I think, one of the icons of the industry. And he's been working at this for plus 25 plus years now. And uh, he's worked at places like West End Games and uh, now currently is the CEO of Steve Jackson Games, which is an iconic game company in itself. And uh, Philip, welcome to the Daiku Podcast. Well, thank you for having me. And I have a technical point. Um, I never worked at West End Games, but I did freelance work with with West End Games. Okay, well, uh, but you were part of the creative process and uh, definitely uh, put your stamp on it, so. uh, My first professional work in the industry was on the West End Games Star Wars RPG. So that was super exciting for me. Wow, very cool. Very educational on the contract front because those were some uh, long contracts. I suspect with Lucas Films, yeah. <laughs> uh, but before we get into some of your amazing experience and information that you're going to share with us today, just tell us how you got into the industry and what inspired you to become a game designer in the first place. So around 84, 85, I ended up with the Zaxxon board game for Christmas. And I loved it, even though the game itself wasn't all that great. And that was about the time I realized people can actually have a career making games. And then shortly after that was playing D&D with friends and I just played Car Wars. And I kept like realizing, you know, this is what people are doing for a living. And I started doing some self-publishing, little fanzines, things like that in the early and mid nineties. And over time just started trying more and more to see, can I make this my full-time job? Because um, at the time I was working at an agricultural publisher, uh, producing a newspaper and magazine, doing a lot of advertising work. And then in 99, Steve Jackson Games put on an open call for somebody to do book layout on a freelance basis. And I was like, I can totally do that. And uh, sent over the resume of sorts and they had a a nominee book for me to lay out. And then later that summer, I was headed to Austin to meet with a friend, uh, Christopher Shy, had just moved down to Austin like the year before. And the guys at Steve Jackson Games were like, well, you're gonna be in town, come by. So I went by and they signed me for like five or six books to do some cover art and layout, things like that. And over that summer and fall, I did a lot of freelance work for them and then signed on full-time late in 99. And my wife graduated from her graduate program and we moved to Austin that uh, Christmas, basically. And Austin is, uh, what are the, what's the slogan for Austin? Uh, keep Austin weird? See, or- I thought the slogan should be treat it like Atlanta in the Civil War, burn it down and start over. <laughs> but what do I know? <laughs> but it's funny. I remember seeing that call uh, from Steve Jackson games and uh, I talked to my wife um, and I said, Hey, like, look at this. We lived in Canada. So it was kind of outside the realm of, at least in my head, it was outside the realm of possibility. And I was like, wow, like that would be so cool to live in Austin and work for Steve Jackson games, which oh. I got my, uh, my car wars uncle albert's here i was a big fan and of course gurps um over the years has been iconic in the industry as well and so what kind of products did you get to work on while you you were there at steve jackson at first um some of the first books i worked on were the suppressed transmission series with ken height i worked on the 2000 release of ogre and the ogre line um, did some covers and just uh, a lot of coordinating with some of the guys in the production arc, uh, area. I also worked on the Cardboard Heroes Dungeon Floors set, and that was probably about three weeks of Photoshop work. And uh, Dennis Lubay would send over images, 
and then I would reconstruct them to build like the pits and walls and things like that. One of the earliest things I did at the company was actually some archives cleanup. Uh, me and another guy spent probably a week going through old paper records of uh, art assets, old paste up boards, because a lot of those old GURPS books and Car Wars books were done with uh, waxer and boards and you'd like cut everything out, lay it out, and then send the boards off to be photographed. That was the way we did it at the newspaper I was at at the time, so I was really familiar with those layout boards when we went through them. And that was a very educational experience. And even now, over 20 years later, I use that because I can kind of remember what did I see and what didn't I see from the company's past. So like when we did the big pocket box Kickstarter campaign a couple of years ago, I knew a lot of the places to go to get the source art and things like that. We used to create some of the stretch goal items, like some folders and journals and stuff like that. And it, it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed going through those old archives. And isn't it amazing the uh, difference between laying out a book today as opposed <laughs> to what it was before? I mean, and I've, I've said this on a couple other videos is like you can really be a one-man band yeah. now compared to i mean the work that would have gone into doing that in the past would would have been incredible and you just couldn't do it or you would see the zines where it would be copy cut paste and scissor cuts and photocopied and yeah back in those days we would bleed for our art not intentionally just sometimes <laughs> with razor blades would uh, skip the metal and find a finger so yeah, and so remember, when did you end up uh, going on your own from uh, Steve Jackson Games and starting to be an indie designer yourself? Um, in 2002, I was still at Steve Jackson Games, but I needed like just some sort of creative outlet. So I spent a weekend and I wrote uh, 101 spell books, which people were doing PDF publishing. And I'm like, I just want to see what this is like and threw it up and I was shocked at the response. Uh, people really loved that. But I stayed with Steve Jackson Games up until about June of 2004. And then I went off and just started uh, working on the Ronin Art stuff pretty much full time. Still did some freelance work for some other people. And then in 2007, Steve was like, well, what are you doing? Why don't you just come back? And he wanted me to come back and be managing editor at the time and I did that uh probably eight or nine months before he promoted me to chief operating officer and i just started taking over the day-to-day -day, uh, running of the business for him before coming back though what was that life like for you being uh like you know your own design studio and freelancer like uh stressful uh or did you seem to always have enough work to keep going and the creative process was that a, a fun time for you Oh, I loved it. Uh, I always want to be making something. And this just gave me the full like permission to do anything I wanted. So there, there would be days I would wake up with an idea and by noon have published that. Um, one of the best examples of that is actually the old campaign planner that was basically had an idea built everything, put it up there. And I don't know how many thousands of copies that thing has now sold over the years, but it was just so fun then to do anything I wanted whenever I wanted. Um, my wife had a good job with the state at the time, so I didn't have to stress too much about the money side. And it gave me a lot of room just to experiment and try things. So, yeah. Did you feel uh, ever like giving up or was it just like you seem to be able to have the success pretty frequently and and how much of that do you attribute to like learning through you know working at steve jackson games versus uh you know kind of trial and error at the time of different projects that you'd work on i wouldn't have been able to succeed at that if it wasn't for everything i'd done before from the newspaper work to steve jackson games Working with Steve, probably the biggest thing I've gotten out of that, in addition to just a different thinking of running the business, but is definitely on the writing and editing side. Um, I knew how to write, 
and I could write okay, but working with Steve allowed me to get up to a slightly more passable level where I don't get too many complaints, but every now and then people are like, your style's weird. You use a lot of words you don't need to. And I'm like, yeah, it's my voice. It's, <laughs> it's me. <laughs> so uh, like uh, Steve and I were even talking about that last week. And one of my things is I hate touching something I've already done. So I'm really bad at like second drafts and final drafts. I just, I can't stand that. And I try and do as much as I can up front so that the second pass can just be as little pain as possible. Because I, I already have more ideas. I want to do something else. I've done that. That's over. But it and was you, definitely working with Steve that helped me like improve that process. Were you intimidated at all when you first got there? Because I mean, I would have been, you know, Steve Jackson games, the Steve Jackson, or did it just become kind of a normal workplace for you? It was pretty much a normal workplace. I mean, fortunately, I'd already been working with the company about six months before I went full time there. So some of that really had kind of faded by then. Okay. And, 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 it, and it's, it's just an office. I mean, yeah, if you've worked in any sort of uh, publishing before. It's very similar. And then when you went on your own, you teamed up with uh, Christopher Shai, uh, who does a lot of the art and you guys formed uh, Ronin arts together. And yeah. so th during that time you put out a uh, uh, four C system, which yeah. Uh, I stumbled upon and it's like a uh, Marvel's uh, TSR Marvel's light. And uh, I had heard that you uh, also got the license to star ACE at one point yes. and you were going to. I bought the rights to star ACE and was going to do something with it and then just got buried in other work and never, never had enough excitement to go back to it. So I still own the rights and maybe someday we'll do something with it, but. I'm in no rush right now. And so what other projects did you uh, guys work on as Ronin Arts together that kind of like you look back upon and go, you know, that was like, I'm pretty proud of that. And it was good stuff. We had some real fun with um, doing the Construct Mechanist series where we did like a race of humanoid mechs for fantasy. That was a blast. We did our own twist on the Mind Flayer and created a product uh, for possessors. And it was these weird like cosmic octopus things that would bite down over someone's head and envelop it. So you'd get kind of the same mind flare effect, but the way they approached it was totally different. For that one, um, Christopher did a bunch of really cool art. And when we released it under the OGL, we made the look of them also open so that people could draw their own interpretation of that and just a lot of stuff like that we whatever we felt like doing we did it was fun and that was kind of the era of like d20 mod and the whole e-publishing craze at the time right and uh i was reading shannon Appleclines uh review of um that time and he said that uh that Ronin Arts was like instrumental in basically the e-publishing era. And then you actually wrote your own book called uh, e-publishing 101 uh, to that effect of trying to teach people how to do this. Yeah, the way that worked, it was a series of PDFs like once every other week or once every three weeks. I don't remember the exact frequency. And for my part in it, I would just offer up ideas of how I did things. I remember one was on the layout and graphic design. And I think in there, I actually talk about the scanning odd things and manipulating them. I did uh, some on coloring, just a little of everything, just whatever. I, I, I don't think it holds up. I haven't looked at it since like 2005 or 2006. And I'm sure everything is different today. Than it was then. Well, it's funny though. I mean, it was a, a very much a precursor to the way things were heading. Obviously, everything's gotten more yeah. and more digital over the years. And uh, you were at the forefront of it and experimenting and making basically PDF publishing um, like you would find on itch. 
or a lot of drive through RPG without any printing. Yeah, I got very lucky there because I saw what some other people were doing and I had an idea for a different approach. A lot of what I did, I was treating it more like magazine articles than full books because I wanted to be the candy rack at the checkout. So as people are buying like this new five, $10 PDF and they're on the way out, they're like, well, this is only a dollar or two dollars. I'm just going to throw it in. And that doesn't sound like much, but when you move thousands or tens of thousands of those every month, it really does start to add up. And when your catalog is in the hundreds of these dollar and two dollar PDFs, it makes a difference. It can really become a thing. And even um, more recently, I've experimented, experimented more with the dollar concept with doing a couple of Kickstarter campaigns where I was just, my goal isn't to take as much money as I can from each person. It's to see how many people I can get to give me at least a dollar for a cool. project. And we're going to review some of those uh, games that you've been creating the uh, the dollar <laughs> games. But first, I want to ask you about this. So here we have uh, Battle Grip, and tell us a little bit about how this came to be. I was back at Steve Jackson Games and needed some sort of creative outlet. So I was like, you know what? Why don't I just write about toys and post things about toys on the internet? And it did far better than I expected. And it was very relaxing and enjoyable when I was doing it. And I did everything from toys, re toy reviews, um, sharing toy news, digging, like here you can see digging into old newspaper advertising and sharing that. I ended up writing 10 or 12 different books about toys over that time. And it was just, it was a, it was a creative outlet. It let me have fun and do things. And um, so do you still have all your old toys? Uh, so I'm basically living in a museum. <laughs> uh, most rooms have four to ceiling wall to wall shelves that are loaded with toys and statues and games. Um, like, I, I don't know how many toys I can see from here. Like I see an old, uh, 1970s Lone Ranger, Silver Horse. I can see an old Scout Walker from Kenner. I've got newer, like there's the new Transformers uh, toys just, just from this year. I mean, it, there's old Fisher Price toys up here. Here's how ridiculous this can get. So I don't know if that's even showing up. Yeah, I can see it. I remember that. That's how far I had to go from well, my gonna... desk in order I, to get this this doesn't probably impress you but i've got all my old uh all my old kenner star wars action figures nice as well and my old land speeders and, and stuff like that so i i think we're of the same era uh, this, <laughs> this, this was important stuff yeah and Super it was fun. and then um so downstairs same thing dining room living room like just wall to wall, floor to ceiling. I've got a uh, storage space. I've got two um, storage sheds here on the grounds, the garage. Um, yeah, if I was smart, I would take all of this and just open my own toy museum someday. But that sounds like a lot of work. Were, were, are you a fan of the toys that made us on Netflix or do you think you yeah. should have been interviewed? Uh, no, I don't think I should have been interviewed. Um, no. <laughs> I'm I'm willing to bet that if I asked somebody over there, they'd be happy to talk to me. I know a couple of people who worked on that, but I don't need to be a part of that. And so uh, after, so you're back at Steve Jackson Games as a COO. Uh, did you do this at that time? The uh, The dozens? Uh, projects. Um, so this new series of dozens, I did that in 2019. So by then I was uh, officially CEO. Awesome. Okay. Of the company. Yeah, 
I didn't start doing much uh, game work on my own again until late in 2018. And again, it just came down to I needed a crea creative outlet of my own. There's a huge difference between doing projects that will be successful for a company because you've got some overhead costs and you just need to make sure that what you're doing can help support the entire business. But when I do projects like this, I don't have to do anything except have fun and relax. That's the most important part. And so, so how is um, it that, uh, cause I've been in this situation before, like where I've done say like video or communications at work. And when I get home, I'm like, oh, you know, I have these like side projects and hobbies that I want to do, but I've been doing it all day at work still, you know, same technical abilities, I guess. And right. I just don't even want to touch it on the nights and the weekends because I've been doing it all day at work. Did that never happen to you? So most of the work I do for myself, I do early, early in the morning and around five or 6 a.m. switch over to office work and uh, handle office work until about five or 5.30 in the evening. And then I try and turn everything off and just disconnect, listen to music, watch videos, something. I'm not, not a night person. So by about that time, my brain's kind of fried. And then the next day I'll wake up uh, I've actually been sleeping more lately, which has been nice, but it's cut into my creativity. Uh, I'm usually up no later than 3.30 or 4 each day. So, but no, um, I don't, I don't see it as work to create my own stuff because it really helps me relax and unwind. And these projects, uh, like in uh, 2000, uh, 2020, if it wasn't for the ability to just disconnect and do my own things, I would have been far more insane than I already was. Like um, you're showing that fantasy city sights and scenes. And that was, that was created thanks to a combination of not driving to the office. So I was saving about an hour and a half to two hours every day around trip there, plus insomnia. So between those two together, that book was roughly a week from when I had the initial idea until everything was completely written and done. And I took the project to Kickstarter. Wow. And it was all because, hey, it's 1 a.m. And guess who's <laughs> up for the day? And the day has started. May yeah. as well do something. And out of curiosity, so I'm showing now uh, Troika. Right. How, how is it that... You know, I, and here's my take on it is, you know, uh, somebody that's had your success in the industry um, might just kind of start mailing things in, but you have not done that. You are still on the cutting edge. I mean, uh, with Troika and Mark Borg, like how, how come you still have that drive after all these years to be so creative and to see up and coming games and going, hey, I want to be a part of this. I love it. I mean, it's I, like people ask me like what motivates you and what motivates me is I love all of this. It's just so fun. Like that odd occurrences that you're showing now, um, that was super fun. The cover is stock art that I licensed, but the interior is where it gets crazy because it is, um, old just public domain art and i downloaded the art constructed the pages and then started writing to fit this thing it's uh i designed around a, a specific format because i'm not a fan of perfect bound books because just the way the spine and everything works, I, I either want a saddle stitch book so it'll open flat or a sewn hardcover so it'll open nicely. 
but this one um this came about because i found this art inside and it inspired me so over the christmas break last year it was like three or four days i just put it all together created it and sent it out as a free pdf to the people who had backed my troika kickstarter which i think was like the smallest kickstarter i did in 2020 but it was just such a fun project the the system is so light and wild and i just i love really rules light games and i really think when it comes to rpgs the rules just get in the way and the gm should do whatever the hell they want and so here's uh, yeah. another another shot of the uh, inside of it and uh yeah and like i said you you're on the cutting edge of like the osr um nsr whatever we want to call it <laughs> uh or osr adjacent games and uh, you created three uh troika supplements i suppose we'd call them um yeah the monstrum prodigium there was what i created first and the other two, the superfluous spells and odd occurrences that were also um, released as part of that same Kickstarter campaign were only made because I had so much fun with the system and just wanted to do more. And again, this uh, superfluous spells, the cover is licensed stock art, but all the interior art is public domain art from I think it might have been the University of Chicago website. One of those, I, I can't remember which one, but they have uh, artwork tagged as what is uh, available for public uh, use. And I was just scanning through that art and I found a couple artists who had some really crazy stuff. And I realized it probably was a decent fit for Troika. So, yeah, like that crazy fish man. So when you, for young designers that are like, I, I'm not a good artist, but I have some kind of maybe interesting ideas and I want to make a role playing game. You there's probably enough stock art out there or maybe open source uh, art uh, or common uh, creative commons licensed art that they can actually make their game as long as they're maybe curating what they they're finding in, in, a, in appropriate ways. Yeah, and just be flexible. Um, so like this uh, superfluous spells, I didn't enter into this with ideas for the spells. I first approached it by tracking down art that I thought looked fun and could be inspiring, and then created the spells around the art. And you, uh, you're not one to rest on your laurels and... Uh... <laughs> and branch out into new areas. So how did this Troika album come to be? The Purple Bonbon? Uh, that came about, well, um, going back, I've always wanted to make music, but tools like GarageBand and stuff just made my head hurt. I didn't understand it. And then last year, sometime in October, uh, my friend David uh, over at uh, GPI, who does a lot of the Steve Jackson game is manufacturing. He and I were discussing it and he's like, hey, there's this new uh, digital audio workstation called Soundtrap that might be what you're looking for. And it was a perfect fit for my brain. I'm not sure why. And I started experimenting with it and learning it. And then they were running the Troika Fest event in April earlier this year. And I decided I wanted to do something not exactly game related, but kind of adjacent to Troika. So I created this album of seven, what I called Troika Wave tracks. And I took the inspiration from the adventure that's in the Troika uh, core rules. So every track corresponds to something that's in that adventure. And it was, it was super fun. I didn't expect it to be any sort of actual moneymaker, which it was not, but it was still a blast. And now I can say, hey, I've made my own CD. And then, uh, so you've used Kickstarter quite a bit and in including 
uh, the delayed blast game master zines. And did you do those part of zine quests? Uh, yes, actually, the first one and third one were both part of zine quest. And the first one came about specifically because they announced scene quest and I decided that looks fun. So. And how do you find using Kickstarter? I mean, it's opened the doors for like a lot of people. Um, how, how much of an impact has it made even to your own personal uh, design process? What I like most about Kickstarter is it allows me to schedule my time and focus on uh, projects and specifically the promotion and sales. I hate self-promotion. I hate selling things. I, I don't have a web store because I can't handle the stress of somebody placing an order on a random Wednesday. And it's like, well, great. Now I have to deal with that. Um, Kickstarter allows me to schedule when those things happen. And one of the things I do with Kickstarter that I know isn't exactly common is I'll announce a survey deadline date. And after that date, anyone who didn't complete their survey gets a refund and just kicked out. And it's because I can't have somebody complete their survey. And I wish I was elaborating on this eight years later and then be, well, why didn't you, why don't I have my stuff? You didn't shoot my stuff. And uh, at the office over the last few years, we implemented a similar policy for that exact reason. We ran that Ogre Kickstarter in 2012. And even to this day, like this year, I've seen people completing their surveys for that project. And we just, I can't deal with that. I've got to have a close to these things so yeah. I can move on to the next step. Yeah. Eight years later is a little bit much. It's a little bit much. And uh, another system that you've uh, taken to heart and have produced for is uh, Mark Borg. And uh, so what drew you to that? Like, uh, I mean, almost immediately, I remember I was following you on uh, Twitter and I saw you put out your first supplement. I can't remember quite which one it was, but uh, I just went, this guy gets it. Like he totally uh, understands like what Mark Borg is doing and he's riding the wave. So I had backed the initial Kickstarter and it was the visuals that drew me in, but then it was the very light game mechanics that kept me there. And they'd go for more, they call it like a doom metal kind of feel. And I try and go for something a little more uh, surreal, some like weird cosmic extra planar horror just stuff. So what I'm doing with the game isn't a exact overlay with the core concepts but it's close enough that a lot of people seem to enjoy it and i just think it's a great little system and it gives me an excuse to have some fun like these um the strange citizens of the city strange inhabitants of the forest and strange visitors to the city were all part of the first kickstarter campaign i did i did for this line and I wrote all three of those together at the same time. So they've got a lot of cross-linking and it was just so fun that I ended up uh, writing Kalo's Book of Monsters, which is like a 64 page hardcover. And it's a weird size. Um, people got really annoyed <laughs> at the size, but that's, that's something I like is to experiment. So it is uh, six and a quarter by 11. Collectors but, like to have consistency. Well, that's not going to work when it comes <laughs> to me in this game because I've got stuff in all sorts of formats. I've got a seven inch record around here somewhere for it as well. And uh, but this one was a uh, weekend of I've got an idea and just building the pages and writing a bunch of monsters. And it was so fun. Yeah, I'm really proud of this one. And the print run ended up being about a thousand and we just shipped another 20 to a retailer like today. So I think we're down to 80 copies left out of this one. And because of the weird size, it can't be print on demand. 
Yeah. And because of the cost in doing a sewn hardcover, um, it's just, it's one printing. I don't plan to reprint this. If I ever do reprint it, it'll probably be as a saddle stitched work just so it'll lay flat, but it definitely won't be a hardcover again because these were pricey. What, who do you use uh, for printing? I, without, I don't know if you want to get into those details, but like yeah, for, totally. for people, uh, how, how, how do you approach your printing process? A lot of it depends on the project. If I'm doing anything saddle stitch these days, I go to Mixam because they've just time and again proven to me that they're really good at what they do. And they're very, very easy to work with. A couple of times I've had problems. They've stepped up and fixed it. Um, for hardcovers, when I did my uh, 10 or 12 toy hardcover books, I used Taylor Printing in Dallas. Uh, Fred Hicks over at Evil Hat had recommended them to me. And I did one book. It was great. So I did more books. And then when I did this Kalo's Book of Monsters hardcover for um, Yorkborg, I went to Taylor again in Dallas for that. For the uh, Tome of Skulls pocket map, that project came about because I wanted to make some folded map products. And I was just doing searches online. And I found a company out of Georgia that offered what I thought was a really cool approach. Yeah, so on that image, the top left and the, no, the top right and bottom left are cardstock pieces that are glued to the paper itself. And this came about 100% because I found this website that said, hey, this is what we make. This, this is all they list and all they make. And I ordered a couple samples and the samples were awesome. And I'm like, I'm totally doing this. And I, I love it. So how I've important actually is made it? four more um, of these, except they're bigger. This is the uh, six panel wide and they offer an eight panel wide. So the Mimics Gelatinous Cube, um, Arctic and dungeon encounter maps that I've made are all this same format. And I have two new ones for um, Yorkborg that I was writing on over the Thanksgiving weekend. I just, I love this format. It feels so good too. Well, I was just gonna ask you that, that tactile, the print, and even like when I think about uh, your upcoming projects, which we'll cover shortly, the vinyl, you you really kind of seem to embrace that. And, and in a world where you were one of the forerunners of e-publishing in the industry, <laughs> and now you're like, I love this print. I love the folding. And it's... So to be fair, I would have done all the print stuff back then if it had been as easy and inexpensive as it is today. Um, there are so many tools available today that we just didn't have 15, 20 years ago. Um, like uh, Alibaba, um, sorry, I'm going to stand up because I want to find the accordion book that I did. And there we go. So this came about because I wanted to make an accordion book. And uh, this is actually, this happened because of a mistake. Because what I wanted to do was an A5 accordion book. So it'd be the same size as this. And when I uh, sent the message to the Alibaba supplier, I typoed and did A4. And they're like, yeah, I can totally do that. And they sent me a blank white sample. And I'm like, that's awesome. Okay, we'll do that. But this, I don't know if you've seen it, is, uh, so it's a book. And That's then when very we get cool. to the end. Neat. So it goes then, both ways. Yeah. But here's the fun thing. It's almost four feet wide. Wow. And all one continuous piece of cardstock that's then glued to these hardcover bindings. So was that like almost uh, an expensive accident, but it's so good that you had to keep it? Well, um, 
I, I rec- what I did was I ordered a white sample from them. It was like $200 or something to get just a blank white because I wanted to prove that it worked and that they could make it. And then I found a second printer and paid them. And so I got two samples in. One of them, they had actually, they couldn't use one continuous sheet of cardstock. So what they did was they had used two and there was a glue seam in one place where they'd put them together. But this printer managed to do it all as one. So once I had the blank in hand, I started designing and writing everything to fit. And I thought it'd be fun, like one side is uh, sacred powers, the other side's unclean powers. And uh, got everything done. I released this as a free PDF for everyone and then ran a Kickstarter campaign to make the print version. That went well. But during the manufacturing process, the printer got back to me and said, oh, we can't do this. We have to do two pieces glued together. And we went back and forth a bit. And eventually it came out, they could do this if I would pay more. So I paid more because I really, I I hated this seam. I just didn't look good. You had uh, mentioned uh, prior to the start of the interview that you would be willing to share your process um, yeah, how sure. you do design and layout. And I'm sure a lot of the viewers would love to kind of see behind the scenes here, the Wizard of Oz yeah. behind the curtain. And uh, I think, uh, the, especially the Mork Bork stuff, like uh, the layout, I can just imagine the combination between like the desktop publishing software and the artwork and how you kind of combine it all would be quite fascinating to kind of, uh, for a lot of people to see that they had never, uh, if they were unsure of how you actually arrived at your final product. Yeah, I would be happy to do that. Um, let me, I think, I think the best thing to do is share my screen. I'm gonna hide that, oh wait. So a uh, technical question. Yeah. If I share the entire screen, it's going to show. Well, let, yeah, there we go. It's going to show that. But I can just move it down out of the way. Um, yeah, I'm not seeing anything. F- there we go. Yeah, that's. Uh... Yeah, just get me out of there. Oh, okay. Like completely, because it's all recorded outside, so. Okay. So um, this is that uh, accordion book. This is one of the files. And what this has are the six pages that make up the uh, longer side, because the way they're glued together, one side is four pages and one side is six pages. And the way I do this is everything is constructed in Photoshop initially. So here's the Photoshop file. And we'll just go through and turn off some layers. So like on this one, I can see I added a color shift. So that was what the stock art looks like. And then I tweaked the color, desaturated a bit, add a little more blue. On this accordion book, I added a black edge to every page because um, I wasn't sure exactly how the printer was going to put everything together. So I wanted to make sure they had a very simple, clean transition between pages. And then once I had constructed the page, I took the entire thing into InDesign and did all the writing there. And that's typically how I work. So like here, what I would have been doing was uh, manipulating the artwork and the text boxes, uh, sizes and placement as I went but I try and do everything as a visual first and then start uh, writing to fit. Uh, Here's a good example 
of what I mean about adding that black edge on either side. That way, when the printer put this together, there'd be less chance of something just weird happening. Mm -hmm. And here we can even see an earlier experiment that I didn't go with, but I ended up going with that instead. Once again, this is uh, primarily the the art is like stock art that you found um, yes. elsewhere. Um, do you have yes. a favorite? I, you mentioned you can often find art through Drive Through RPG. Um, Shutterstock is handy. Drive Through RPG is handy. There are no shortage of um, sites out there for different museums and stuff. I think it was the it's a British museum or library or somebody put up a giant batch of work on Flickr that they just come out and say this is all ancient work public domain do as you wish and it just it's so fun yeah like uh this I'm pretty sure the whole thing is just constructed in Photoshop yeah So this was, uh, and here I use the content aware fill I can see. I don't know if you've ever, ever experimented with that. The content aware, is that is that part of the new AI? Yeah, it's been around for a little bit, but it's gotten so much better um, because if you've got, if you need something for bleeds or just need to fill out a space, you can do a content aware fill and it's not always perfect, but like, I don't know if you wow. just saw how that worked. I, I see their updates and I watch them and I go, oh, that's cool. But I never usually get around to using them, but that's pretty cool. Yeah, this is, so I started with Photoshop in 95 and it used to be, oops. It, that would be like 15, 20 minutes of uh, clone stamp yeah. work. And here it's just like click, click, done. So what about those uh, new designers that uh, might not have Photoshop skills or layout skills? Do you, do you think they should like learn them? Um, and yes. they can do this kind of work or, or do their own art even at some point? Uh, my opinion is the tools that are available now are not hard to learn. And you can uh, watch some videos, pick up some books, and just teach yourself. As soon as you're able to start doing your own layout and graphic work, you're going to find you're a lot happier with the finished product, I think, because it can really be what you want. Um, like, uh, if, I, if I was just a writer, and didn't have any of the other skills, I would not make nearly as many things as I do because I was just I would just be so frustrated with the process of waiting on other people to do their part of the project. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm just I'm lucky that I started from a graphics uh, background, so it gave me a huge leg up. But the the tools these days, um, I've never used. I think it's Affinity. Mm -hmm. the yeah. software that a lot of people use and I see the work and you can do work just as good as something with Photoshop and InDesign using like the GIMP shop uh, and yeah. then Affinity like there's tools out there and like I use YouTube all the time if yeah. I want to do something and I'm like eh, I don't know how to do that yeah University so, of YouTube you could learn so much just by uh, watching oh, videos. Yeah. And, um, and I guess another big question, I know we're coming to the close of our time here, uh, but kind of a big question of what advice do you give to these young designers? Because I've often mentioned in today's world, compared to say 1995, there's so many good games out there. How do you stand out? How do you, how do you get noticed? How do you... Uh, achieve the goal of being a game designer um, in today's world? My opinion is do what you like. Um, is it Malcolm Gladwell, I think, 
has a book where he specifically talks about there's an audience for everything out there. And if you do what you love, the audience will find you if you just keep putting it out there long enough. And I think if you want to be publishing and designing, like creating RPGs, just do it. You're going to suck. I've got some fanzines around here from like 92, 93 that will prove you're not going to be really good at what you're doing initially, but just keep doing it and you're going to get better. And as long as you love it and you're having fun, other people are going to enjoy it. That's, that's the trick. And yeah, definitely go to YouTube as much as you can, because there are so many tricks you can learn there. Um, I, like I have to use Excel all the time for work and I hate Excel. I respect it. I respect people who like really know how to use Excel because I've seen some people like pull magic with that thing, but there's basic things in Excel that I'm always like, oh, I got to pull up that video again. Cause I don't remember how this works. <laughs> so, and it's the same thing. Um, I use Excel constantly when I have an idea for something in Photoshop that I'm sure it knows how to do, but I don't know the trick. Yeah. So yeah, you use the tools and there's um, several indie RPG designers out there who are always generous with their time and willing to like answer questions or offer encouragement and feedback. The RPGs, RPG zines Facebook group is a really good one for that. I see people constantly like sharing their projects and ideas and it's just, it, it's fun. So oh, it's all about community and uh, helping each yeah. other out and, and learning from each other and supporting yeah. each other. Always. Great. Well, uh, where, what's next for you and where can we find more about what you're up to? Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure what's next for me, but I've been staring at Nave an awful lot. And uh, some friends and I are talking about getting together for some role-playing sessions. And I, I like, I bought, I think it was six or seven copies of the Nave book in print to just take and distribute at the table. Cause I want to experiment that with that. It seems extremely light, but I haven't had a chance to play yet, but it, it something about it definitely fits my taste so after i play that a few times i may end up trying to hack it and do my own thing with it um i've got the mimics project coming up i feel like i'm really bad at what i do here because i probably should have talked about that <laughs> way more um but just so everybody knows this is the worst thing I've ever created in my entire life. It is pure garbage. And you do not want to back the Kickstarter campaign when it launches next month, because you're just going to be frustrated and disappointed. But what I've done is created a new pocket map that is all about mimics. And it is as totally worthless as it sounds. I mean, like it's got this section on what is that rascally mimic up to now? It's got a little section to make mimics magical, and it goes in here and has like different variants. Oh, I like got, that. I like the groovy uh, rainbow in 1970s look to it. <laughs> it's got sections on um, what's the mimic copying got a tiny little mimic lair and adventure but as if that wasn't terrible enough on top of it i went ahead and also created a uh, gelatinous cubes pocket map so this when it's opened up is a little over 29 inches wide by almost 16 inches tall but yeah, like a 5d6 worthless things stuck inside a gelatinous cube. <laughs> 3d6 valuable things stuck inside a gelatinous cube. Um, well, it looks like a fun what project. You doing now? What's that? It looks like a fun project. Like uh, you must have had fun making it. I had fun, but it's trash. Nobody should follow the campaign on Kickstarter. That would be a bad idea. 
and they definitely do not want to back it. I mean, the best thing we can hope for is this project fails completely so that the four maps that I made, I can just delete from the hard drive and they never see the light of the day. Well, that's it's like my mom telling me horrible. I shouldn't eat my uh, spinach and me and me eat my spinach just to prove her wrong. So no, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't even know what we were talking about anymore. I start talking about projects and forget everything. Well, just where can where can they find you? You're on Kickstarter, uh, Philip uh, Reed on uh, Kickstarter, and you're on Twitter. Oh, yeah, I'm um, on Twitter. It's Philip J Reed. Um, there's office stuff that people should check out at Steve Jackson games because we're always making things. We've got a STL project for the fantasy trip actually launching later this month. I should pull up some of those. Sorry, you shouldn't get me started talking because I'll just talk. Oh, we're always happy to see what you're up to. But I, so, um, the STL campaign is um us making fantasy minis and my part of that has been in addition to just um being there and like brainstorming and answering but i've been doing a lot of the minis photography oh, for great. that and uh preparing the kickstarter campaign but Ben Williams in our office painted these. And I mean, Ben's phenomenal at what he does. So is photography also another uh, side hobby of yours? Uh, yes, I love taking photos. And every now and then I get to actually do it for work related things. Like on the Car Wars Kickstarter, I did most of the minis photography. And again, Ben painted the minis. But like, I just love this shot with all these skeletons. Yeah. The terrain there is Hearst Arts. Um, terrain that my wife actually did all the casting and constructing. And then together we painted it. But the, this project has been well over a year in the making, and we're going to launch it on Kickstarter later this month. And I am super excited to see how people respond to it, because I think they look phenomenal. They do. And, uh, you know, obviously, in today's world, it's actually funny, like, I started off with lead minis. And like, right. I mean, the tools were not good. And like, primer and all that kind of stuff and now it's so like everything else everything's just improved so much more yes but minis really lend themselves to like say social media and sharing your painting and way more than like a game design because when you're working on a game how do you kind of show progress on it and it's kind of to share on twitter you know nobody wants to see a text box it's not that interesting <laughs> compared to a, a mini or see me taking five minutes to write and rewrite the last sentence because <laughs> I didn't like it. <laughs> yeah, um, the painting live streams, I know people, it's almost like AS ASMR videos at that point where they're watching it. Yeah. But again, uh, going back to how much the tools have changed, 20 years ago when I was trying to photograph minis, it was horrible. Like just, oh. You gotta have a macro lens and then the macro lens is no good because well now i can see everything and it doesn't look so good but for this project and the car was project i just use my phone at this point it's such an incredible camera yeah I, i've got i probably have eight cameras in the house and my phone is the one that gets used constantly and provides better photos than like dslrs i bought six seven years ago yeah. So what's, just, what's the old saying? The the best camera is the one you have? Yes. Well, it's like um, you doing the video work here. I keep wanting to get into that. But I just, I, I'm so picky when it comes to sound and everything. I just, I can't. I, I, it would drive me insane. But I really want to. I, I want to take a stab at video work one of these days. Yeah, I've uh, I've quite enjoyed it. And the best part of my job or this project that I've been doing is getting to meet people like you that uh, can inspire uh, designers 
to keep their dream alive and share your knowledge and uh, and your passion for what you do. So I really want to thank you for uh, joining me. And uh, yeah, my pleasure. And, and I ho hope to see all your projects on Kickstarter, including some of uh, your vinyls that you've got uh, in the works. And uh, and we'll make sure that we uh, keep checking back with you if you don't mind coming back and visiting with us when you have uh, a new project or some other stuff that yeah. you want to share. I'd love to. Thank you. Okay. Well, once again, uh, just really, really, truly appreciate you uh, taking some time today and uh, all the best in the future. And uh, we'll, we'll see you uh, on Kickstarter. Thank you very much. <laughs>